returning to Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's King Lear, uh, and we're in the middle of the play. We're going to resolve the or complete the play today. Uh, but I just wanted to reiterate what I said last time and um, emphasize something that occurred to me actually afterwards when writing it up, uh, a little summary for, for YouTube actually. And it occurred to me that it was uh, something I hadn't fully emphasized in the lecture, which is that there's a plot here between Lear and his three daughters a subplot, which is very clear as well, between Gloucester and Edmund and Edgar. <clears throat> but then there's a third element in it, and in the person of the fool, who isn't there in either of those scenes. He's removed himself from this because he knows what's going to happen, and he's just gone from the scene. He appears later in Act One. <clears throat> but he takes on a significant role in the play. He's a very memorable figure, and he doesn't seem to be um, part of the plot or the subplot per se. He's part of the plot, but he's removed from the scene. And he gets identified very much with Cordelia. And, and the two are foils for one another in a certain way. And, and in some ways they get conflated later on when um, the fool disappears. And what happens to him? Not sure. It's not stated. Uh, but he just, he's gone. Uh, exit the stage and doesn't, isn't heard from anymore. When Cordelia hangs herself, Lear says that his poor fool is dead. So I think, without overstating the significance of this, I do think there's something of the connection between Cordelia and the fool, and the fool as a representation of wisdom, which is absent from the court at the time when Lear makes the decision to banish uh, both Cordelia and Kent, and also to divide up his kingdom. It's an act of madness. The fact that the fool, is a fool who represents wisdom is absent from the decision. Um, and in the end, that wisdom is hanged. Um, I do think that there's something being stated by Shakespeare. It's a minor point, but it, uh, it almost seems to go outside of the plot and the subplot. But it's not insignificant because, as I said, one of the things that makes this tragedy so overwhelming is the apparent senselessness of this death. Like a lot, I, I've emphasized that in Shakespeare's tragedies, there's a, an assertion of God's providence and orderliness, and there's a, you know, the malefactors are punished, and there's a, a restoration of order and um, a reassertion of God's providence, even, the men's in, even in the midst of wicked actors. But this tragedy is particularly bleak because Cordelia dies. And... Um, and it seems to go outside the boundaries of, of justice. <clears throat> and um, I'm wondering aloud if this is some, a statement about wisdom and uh, abandoning wisdom and wisdom dies in this situation. Without overstating it, I think there's something there in that. And I haven't read much on that, but it just it struck me and I wanted to reiterate that because I do think it's there, and the fool now is going to accompany Lear on the heath in the midst of the storm. It's one picture of it, which I like, just because he's wearing the fool's cap here. Um, <clears throat> is at the height of his mental insanity, his breakdown. Act 3, scene 2, urging on the storm, and he actually is in dialogue with the storm, with nature. Uh, he's still doing what would come naturally in Shakespeare's world, which is to make analogies according to the microcosm, macrocosm, which is so much a part of classical literature as well. E even in philosophy, as I said, Plato's Republic is really a, um, a reflection on the, on the human person, the hierarchies within the individual, the reason, the will, the passions, and what, what should be ordering what and how education should function uh, if reason is actually ruling things. What's that, what's that going to look like politically? And in fact, that's what the Republic is about. He says it's about justice. How do we make sure that justice is done? Well, let's look at it on a civic level, at the polis. And who will be in charge here? But the who will be in charge. It's not really about politics. It's more about what should govern you. 
And so here's the illustration that will help it become more persuasive to you that you should follow your reason or rather your virtues should be led by your reason. And you'll find different ways of reiterating that, like, like as in the allegory of the chariot in the Phaedrus, talks about the white horse and the black horse. The black horse drives you down to earth. Those are your passions and it's, it's not led by reason. It's led by your, what we would call from a Christian perspective, your sinful desires. Uh, whereas the white horse uh, wants to rein upwards and, and the man that in the chariot is, is trying to follow the lead of the white horse. And if he does so and manages to do so, then it, it will help uh, prevent a disaster. But there's this conflict within the person. There are two horses. There, there's a sinful side of you and there's a, a virtuous side. And you have to make sure that the virtuous side wins out by, by keeping your eye on the sun and pursuing reason, etc. cetera. Um, here, Lear, having abandoned wisdom at the outset of the play in an act of madness, um, divides up his kingdom. It's not just that he loves the two daughters who profess their love for him more than the daughter who plainly loves him the most. It's more that he, his decision is to divide up the kingdom. And, and whenever you divide up a kingdom, civil war is coming. So that's the effect of this decision. It's not going to be, it's not going to end well. It's, it's, the seeds of destruction are already sown and they can't be overcome. The initial act of madness is insuperable, save by a bloodletting which will ensue here. And Lear brings it about. Cordelia is banished in part because she won't play the game. And yet she's thoroughly admirable. We, we saw that, how she was portrayed in The King of France, loves her, even though she has no dowry, because she herself is a jewel, because she loves wisdom, and she loves virtue, and she's going to retain her virtue, irrespective of the fact that there's no reward for it, because she loves it for itself. So she's an exemplary, perfect figure of, of filial duty of a daughter towards the father, but even of a commitment to truth and goodness, even though it costs her everything. And the fool likewise is absent from the scene. He can't bear to be there, but in the end there's, a, there's an, uh, an analogy being made between the fool and uh, Cordelia that I think uh, keeps being pressed through this. So it's really a reflection outside of the political considerations and all of the dramatic, he's thinking about wisdom, I think. So it's a, a little bit, maybe an abstract way of reading it, but I think he, he thinks in these terms. And I, I think it's a very Renaissance way of looking at things that is also a classical way of doing it, but now it's normed by Christian thought as well. But he, he's retaining this analogy between microcosm and macrocosm. And here we see it on the, on the heath in Act 3, Scene 2. At the height of his mental breakdown, actually screaming at the storm to intensify. Blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage blows. So addressing the storm and urging the storm on. He's not fleeing from the storm. And I remember a storm throughout literature, but particularly in scripture, is a sign of judgment. A sign that the, the elements are rebelling, are, are threatening the dissolution of order. And he is urging it on. It's, it's really Lear, as we see him in Act 1, Scene 1, being most himself. He wants dissolution. There's something demonic about it even no mention of demons here by the way but and he misunderstands the storm as a mirror of himself he's very selfish in his understanding but he has ever but slenderly known himself that's what the two sisters Goneril and Regan say he's never known himself and so the injunction to the audience is know yourself in your in your judgments don't think that there are no consequences, that you can act autonomously. This is a very enlightenment perspective that Lear takes here. He acts as if he were a free agent 
divorced of concerns and yet he can hold on to everything. He can just allow nature to be natural according to his own terms, just by a fiat act of will. And to disregard all of the chain of um, responsibilities that are connected to the kingship, including the family and relations to God and so forth. I mean, as I said, Lear is presented very much in pagan terms, not in Christian terms as Macbeth is. But he sees the storm in self-centered terms as a reflection of himself, as a victim of injustice. Show in your rage the injustice that I have suffered. See, he sees it again in a macrocosmic way, but now on his own deluded, selfish terms. Blow winds and crack your teeks, cheeks, rage, blow you cataracts and hurricanes, spout till you have drenched our steeples. Drown the cocks, the cocks that are at the top of the, hill, uh, of the houses, the weather cocks. You sulfurous and thought-executing fires, vaunt couriers of oak cleaving thunderbolts, singe my white head, and thou all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the world. Crack nature's molds, all Germans spill at once that make ingrateful man. He wants to destroy everything. This is a diabolical will of destruction, a will to destruction. It's not a will to power, it's a will to destruction, of annihilation. And, and it does echo the, uh, the flood narrative in, in his speech. Remember, in the flood narrative, God judges and the water comes down from heaven, but it also bursts forth from the deep and threatens to uh, undo the ordering process that God initiates in Genesis 1, where he separates and creates divisions and order and hierarchies, and that the chief of that hierarchy is man on the sixth day. There's a sense of a crescendo, there's a building up, a climax. The crown of creation is man who's made in God's image. It's not just one order, it's that we're building and it's going up, up, and at the top of that, man now has been created, but here man is being stricken at the end who's un ungrateful. Well, the most ungrateful man is actually Lear himself. He's ungrateful towards his daughter, actually, Cordelia, who's loved, and Kent. He's banished the most loyal Very foolish man, remains a fool throughout, actually. And whether he actually rehabilitates himself in any way is in, in question here. We'll get to that. But, the, but the, note who's with him, the fool. Now the fool is with him out of love and compassion and of an attempt to rescue Lear from his madness. Fool, oh, nuncle, court. Holy water in a dry house is better than this rainwater out a door. Good nuncle, in, ask thy daughter's blessing. Here's a night pities neither wise men nor fools. Not going to listen. Rumble thy bellyful, spit, fire, spout, rain, nor rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Then let fall your horrible displeasure. Here I stand your slave, a poor, infirm, weak, and despised old man. But yet I call you servile ministers that will with two pernicious daughters join your high engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. Oh, oh, tis foul. So he allies himself with nature here. And in a sense, he is reverting to what um, uh, philosophers will call following um, Hobbes, the state of nature. Shorn of moral considerations, where man in his uh, life is, I com I, I'm forgetting the exact quote, but nasty, brutish, and short. And he sees this as a, a superior state to that of having ungrateful daughters. 
He would rather ally himself with that sense of a nature shorn of moral uh, contours, having banished moral considerations and, and justice in his edicts, he now he, he doubles down on what he did at the outset. He wants nature shorn of uh, moral considerations, what, what Lewis calls the Tao, and also of, of personal relationships, the things that most make men men. The relationship between Adam and his wife, the family that arises out of this, the relationship with God, who's personal as well. You want, he wants all of those gone. And he would rather have nature destroying him physically than that in his pain. <coughs> and, then he, but, and the fool is there to try and counsel him in his mental distress to at least save him his physical self for, for a time. He that has a house to put his head in has a good headpiece. The man that makes his toe what he his heart should make shall of a corn cry woe and turn his sleep to wake. For there was never yet fair woman, but she made mouths in a glass. She looked at herself in the mirror and doing or showing her lips or eh, whatever. <laughs> Yes, there's vanity in women, like reflecting on Lear's daughters. Yes, there is fault there. There's, there's, there, there's fault on their part. Yes, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that you need to go beyond all moderation and be so extreme in your responses to the injustices done to you. Lear's response, no. I will be the pattern of all patience, I will say, nothing. I will not go back to my daughters. I will not ask them to take me in. I will model patience, yes, but patience and at the same time bloody-minded refusal to in any way act like a human being and ask for comfort because that would mean having to submit to his daughters as if his daughters were his masters, which they now are, because he's made them this. He won't do it. Now Kent comes in, same sort of thing ensues. <clears throat> and Kent sees a man who's now totally um, broken. And again, he also has compassion for him. So the two figures, and there's a third, there's a triumvirate of sorts. There's the fool, there's Kent, and then there's Cordelia, um, who are our so, sort of holy trinity that are going to try and bring Lear to rehabilitate himself in some ways. They're on the side of the good, but uh, not enough there. But he even gets to the point, <clears throat> um, let me go back to this speech here where he calls upon the nature's molds and so forth, the Germans to spill at once. Um, there are certain structures, uh, Germans that he calls here, from which man's mortal ma uh, nature is created and he calls even for their destruction. Everything about mankind he wants gone. Total tabula rasa, let's go down further. I want total destruction. If I can't have my will, then everything must burn. This is the madman. Uh, and expresses an image of nature's molds here, um, which he is willing to break. And in so doing, he's defying God, the God-ordained, created order. He's willing to break down so that he might have his will and yet accuses his daughters of ingratitude when he himself expresses ingratitude for the, the creature comforts that God provides just simply by giving us an inhabitable nature. And he even uh, accuses the elements of siding with his daughters against him. In the second speech here, nor when are my daughters, I tax not you elements with unkindness, I never 
gave you kingdom, called you children, but still he sees them as siding against them, and he sees it as an agency of divine justice, the storm. Very confused, self-absorbed rant. Ugly scene. Kent enters in, the fool, and eventually we're going to have, um, let me go to the, the fool. After Lear and Kent leave, the fool is left on the stage and this fool speaks to some degree wisdom here in his soliloquy. So he walks up stage to the front and says this to the audience, I'll speak a prophecy ere I go, when priests are more in word than matter, when brewers mar their malt with water, when nobles are their tailors tutors, no heretics burnt, but wenches suitors, when every case in law is right, no squire in debt, nor no poor knight, when slanders do not live in tongues, nor cut purses come not to throngs, then shall the realm of Albion, England, come to a great confusion. Then comes the time, who lives to see it, that going shall be used with feet. This prophecy Merlin shall make, for I live before his time. Very mysterious speech in some ways, but he puts it as a prophecy. Uh, is this Shakespeare speaking to his audience about this, the sense of justice being um, enacted in his day? Again, he talks about um, no heretics burnt but wenches suitors. Again, those who are commit, uh, guilty of fornication, just like we saw in uh, Measure for Measure, but not real injustice, being uh, just at the, at the lesser level. Uh, on, uh, when slanders do not live in tongues, nor cut curses come to throngs, then shall the realm of Albion come to great confusion. A dissolution of England. Then comes the time. And this prophecy Merlin shall make. Who knows what this means? I don't know what it means. Reference to, though to Merlin, the, the, the sage, the wizard in, uh, on, in Arthur's court. Uh, but it's not yet here. Then we go back to Gloucester's castle. And now we have Gloucester and Edmund, the subplot. So having seen the, the, uh, the nadir of the plot with Lear mad, and uh, cut off from civilization, out in the wilderness, literally. Remember, the romantics make much of how good nature is, and civilization is wicked. Shakespeare is under no such illusions and follows the classical understanding that uh, to be outside the city and away from civilization is to be in a state of nature which is inhospitable to man. From a biblical perspective, the wilderness is equally associated with the haunt of demons. You, go, you're cast, you are sent out in the wilderness, and this is a dangerous place. It's a place where you're going to be destroyed or tempted unless God is with you in the wilderness. Remember, Jesus goes into the wilderness as well for the 40 days of temptation. But uh, Moses uh, leads the people through the wilderness for 40 years so that they might die off, but God is with them. He preserves some of them along the way. At any rate, the wilderness has negative connotations and, um, and not uh, for human benefit. This is the world in which the devil reigns. And Lear is subjected, subjected to those elements willingly. So the Nadir there in terms of the plot, how about the subplot? Enter Gloucester and Edmund. Alack, alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural. Again, note the rhyme scheme here is speaking very common to one another. Initiated by Gloucester, very happy to not speak in noble tones. Alack, alack, Edmund, I like not this unnatural dealing. Now he's appealing to nature in what sense? The, the word nature is a, is a key word in Lear. It's used in a, a multiple fashions. Sometimes it refers to the moral nature, the moral order of things, and that's what is meant here by Gloucester. I don't knight like these unnatural dealings. There, it, there's, it, there's no moral goodness in it. 
we've already seen that Gloucester has denied that moral order by having a child out of wedlock, namely Edmund, who he calls a bastard. And he acknowledges him because he was, his breeding was from good sport. That's pretty much it. If you're a boy and you listen to your father talk about your mother this way and your relations, you're not going to be particularly pleased, I think. There's going to be anger. And also the fact that he's considered, legally speaking, a bastard uh, is also going to put his nose out of joint a little bit. So Ed Gloucester, just like Lear, is the cause of the anger in the children, just like David is the cause of the rebellion in Israel by having an affair with Bathsheba, he unleashes a civil war. That's the early beginnings. Now the son is, happens to be Solomon, very interesting. Again, is this a reflection on uh, Solomon connected with wisdom in conjunction with all that? It's there in the background. I don't think there's an explicit uh, reflection on that per se, but I just note uh, th that those precedents are here for us to consider. <clears throat> but I don't like this unnatural dealing. When I desired their leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house, charged me on pain of perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him, entreat for him, or in any way sustain him. So Gloucester has been dispossessed of his own house and threatened for simply wanting to show compassion to poor Lear. And it does demonstrate, now again, it's hardly the case that Gloucester is a good representative of the moral order of things. He is not, he is not an admirable man. But he has a shred of the mil milk of human kindness in him, and he show, has compassion. Do you really need to let that poor old man go out in the wilderness? You have all the power. You don't have to let him do this. Don't you know, sh show mercy here. They won't have it. And just for suggesting mercy, he is effectively dispossessed and threatened with further consequences. It's unnatural, he says, and it is. But it's not natural, unnatural if sin is our nature. And that is what is the subplot here, and it's never mentioned. There's a, the sin is becoming more and more sinful. Wickedness is, is multiplying. The play is getting darker as it goes. And we know what's about to happen to Gloucester if we have seen this famous play before. He's going to go blind. He's not going to go blind. He's going to have his eyes plucked out of him in a way that is reminiscent of Oedipus and Oedipus the king, although he takes out his own eyes. Here they are forcibly removed from him. It's one of the most horrid scenes in literature. They're going to basically pop his eyes out, torturous. It's not going to happen on stage, by the way. That's for a contemporary uh, filmmaking and stuff like that, where they actually graphically portray something. It'll happen off stage. He'll come back on, probably with a gauze over his face, and there'll be red on the gauze because of the bleeding. And you'll know, and you'll maybe hear the screaming, and that's enough. You can imagine it. Far worse, but they're not going to demonstrate because it's debasing to the audience to see these things. It's debasing. The graphic is not realism. It is a sort of realism, but it's a debasing realism. We know what's happened. We don't need to see it. We're not helped in our understanding of what's happened by seeing it. It should not be much of what's presented in uh, graphic violence these days, even in CGI, should not be seen. When I desired their leave, they took my house away. So, so the analogy between him and Lear is now pushed strongly uh, in terms of the subplot. What happened to Lear is now going to happen to him. But he did nothing to merit it in some senses. He didn't uh, dispossess his son, although, or, or did he? What's just happened in the play up to this point? He's banished his faithful son. Edgar, he wants him hunted down and killed on the basis of rumor and innuendo. Innuendo, that's it. And Edmund is now his favorite son, who's the, as I say, the anti-dramaturge figure who's pulling the strings and is willing to basically take out everyone. So he's very much like the two sisters, Goneril and Regan, and we're going to see an evil triumvirate rise here. 
an alliance between the two sisters who have designs on Edmund for some reason and are willing to forego their relationships with their husbands to have some sort of relationship with him. They're going to throw off all restraint and they become pictures of wickedness. We don't see that at the beginning of the play. As the play goes on, the facade of uh, goodness that's in the sisters is removed and we have a very ugly portrait of, of two women and likewise Edmund. They're playing a part, but they're hypocrites and they're doing it to get power. And that seems to be their only motivation at this point. There's no moral restraint on them either. But Edmund is happy to go along with his father and continue to deceive him. He says, oh, most savage and unnatural. He knows all about this. Go to, say you nothing. There's a division between the dukes and a worse matter than that. Now he divulges to him something that is disastrous for the whole play and which will prevent it from being a comedy. He will divulge to him that there's a plot to come back on the, uh, the king of France is going to return with Cordelia and undo this wickedness and madness. And of course, Edmund, who will only benefit if the current state prevails, is going to seek to stop that from happening. Because if, if, if justice is restored, then the injustice from which he benefits will be of no avail to him. So he will disclose what he's about to have revealed to him. There's a division between the dukes and a worse matter than that. I've received a letter this night. Tis dangerous to be spoken. I have locked the letter in my closet. These injuries the king now bears will be revenged home. There is part of a power already footed. We must incline to the king. I will, I will look him and privily relieve him. Go you and maintain talk with the duke that my charity be not of him perceived. If he ask for me, I am ill and gone to bed. If I die for it, as no less has threatened me, the king, my old master, must be relieved. He's willing to do the right thing. So there's a little bit of nobility in the old duke after all. The Duke of Gloucester must be relieved even if it costs me my life. So he's not a bad guy. There's strange things toward Edmund. I pray you be careful. He leaves. Now, Edmund, note the change in, again, the meter. Now he speaks in noble tones. Soliloquy. He's on stage by himself. This courtesy forbid thee shall the duke instantly know. And of that letter, too, this seems a fair deserving and must draw me that which my father loses, no less than all. The younger rises when the old doth fall. So his ambition, his naked ambition, to benefit from the treason towards his father, a betrayal of trust between a man and another man, but, but here in particular a son towards his father and a son towards the fidelity he owes to all that is good makes Edmund the complete villain. He's a terrible figure. H happy to uh, be upset about being called a bastard, but willing, be willing to act like a bastard in the metaphorical sense as we use it. This is a very bad man. Act 3, scene 4 opens on the heath before a hovel, so it's a little shelter hardly a palace, but he's going to present it as a palace. So it's a bit like, although this is before the period, this is Milton Satan. Um, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I don't rather, I don't want to be back. I would rather be here in this array and he's going to have subjects in front of him played out and he, he, he acts like a monarch in the midst of, quite frankly, a very um, dilapidated and um, austere scene indeed in the midst of the storm still. But act four, or act three, scene four, the heath before a hovel, enter Lear, Kent, fool. Here is the place, my lord. Good, my lord, enter. The tyranny of the open nights too rough for nature to endure. Now again, the word nature, but here he just means physical nature. There's a connection between our physical 
being and our mental health. If you're broken uh, beyond endurance on a physical level, you will suffer other breakdowns as well. Let's first get you out of the rain and the cold. L Lear, in response, let me alone. Again, one of the signs of severe mental distress is that people distance themselves from those that would be of comfort to them. They self uh, alienate. And I've noted it in pastoral ministry. I've noticed it as uh, in the student body here. When people are uh, distressed, they act unusually and they, they will literally physically separate themselves from others. They sit at the back of the classroom. They where, where if they weren't sitting back there as a habitual thing, they distance themselves and they tend to be, in, their, in the way they physically com comport themselves, they're sort of crouching a little bit and you can see that there's distress going on. You don't know the nature of the distress, but you can see it and they pull away and they don't talk to other people and so forth. There's something going on in there. You can observe it and you can try and address it in some ways. You actually go and physically speak to somebody and they're not necessarily going to be open to it, but they're what, um, but they, in general, they're, I have not usually found that they're, will, they're gonna reject it, but they're not gonna seek it out. You actually have to go to them and show a little solidarity in that situation. But Lear does not want it. And so they're gonna have to insist on it for his own sake. Good, my Lord, enter here. Will it break my heart? Why doesn't he want to go way back in? Look at that line. Isn't that a great line? Wilt break my heart. He doesn't want to go back to civilization because he's so hurt that he fears being hurt again by those close to him, those who are compassionate towards him. He can't, he doesn't have enough reserves within him to trust another person. That's how deeply he's been wounded by his daughters. So we, we should take that seriously. And I, I think it's a great, uh, way of illustrating this. And as I say, Lear at this point is a very complex character, but you have to show something of the humanity of Lear here. And that, so this phrase, will break my heart, is, a, is a, a request to know if he can trust in anything. He who has broken trust nonetheless suffers from his own actions. I'd rather break mine own, said Kent. Good my Lord, enter faithful friend. Thou thinkst tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin, so tis to thee. You just are worried about the physical threat of the storm, makes us wet and cold. But where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. There's a greater harm to him represented by this storm. Thou shun a bear, but if thy flight lay towards the roaring sea, thou wouldst meet the bear in the mouth. If there were a greater wickedness, at, as in the moral wickedness that he, and the relational betrayal that he's experienced, you would rather face a storm. What Lear is asserting here is a hierarchy and awareness. And without invoking and endorsing Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, effectively he's saying the things that are above it are actually greater. But that doesn't mean that you only attain them when you have these other things provided. They're always there with you all along. Always. And love and fidelity are the most important of all those in every situation. Even when you lack food and comfort, the fact that somebody cares for you and has compassion for you is more important to you than the physical shelter. And we see it demonstrated here by Lear. We're not materialists. We don't need to think like Abraham Maslow and the psychological um, field that's followed in this line of thinking. There's a hierarchy here which is rooted in the love of God and the rule of God through a, a hierarchical chain of relationships that we call the great chain of being here. But he's invoking a hierarchy here and the importance of it. If, if, if the greater evil were masked by the lesser evil, you would avoid the greater evil yourself. 
and not just complain about the storm. When the mind's free, the body's delicate. The tempest in my mind, okay, so there's an internal tempest. Note again, microcosm, macrocosm language. There's a tempest out here that you suffer from, but there's an internal tempest in the mind. My mind doth from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there. Filial ingratitude. Is it not as this mouth should tear this hand for lifting food to it? But I will punish home. No, I will weep no more in such a night to shut me out. Pour on, I will endure in such a night as this. O Regan, Goneril, your old kind father, whose frank heart gave all. O oh, that way madness lies. Let me shun that. No more of that. So he's focused on the betrayal of his daughters. That's the thing that torments him, not the storm. The physical storm is nothing. Good, my lord, enter here. Prithee go in thyself. Seek thine own ease. This tempest will not give me leave to ponder on things would hurt me more. But I'll go in. In, boy, go first. You houseless poverty, nay, get thee in. I'll pray and then I'll sleep. And the fool goes in. It's pity on the fool. Poor naked wretches whatsoever you are that, pot, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm. How shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and windowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Now he thinks for the first time, perhaps, <coughs> on the plight of the poor, the, those, the, those that are homeless. As a king, he has compassion. He's moved to consider others other than himself for the first time. So he, he's reached rock bottom on a personal level, but this actually strangely leads to the possibility of a redemption for him because now he actually, for the first time, is something other than totally selfish. And so as I say, there's a little bit of glimmer of light. And again, in this typical in Act 3, there's a, a, a possibility of a counter movement. We already know about it because Gloucester has revealed it to Edmund and therefore to the audience that yes, there is a move afoot. In fact, the troops are already marching here to try and undo this terrible state of affairs in England coming from France. Oh, I have taken too little care of this. Take physic, pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel that thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. I should show charity. Charity is just love, but it's love shown to those that are poor. Invoked by the church from time immemorial, charity. Charity is, is just a, a word for love, and it's a particular type of love, and it, it relates to the dealing with human needs on a physical, but also on a spiritual level, showing compassion there. Edgar. Now Edgar appears in the midst of all this. Now remember going back to Edgar, Edgar had willingly chosen to, pr to present himself as a madman, as a f crazy. It's an antic disposition that he puts on because in a sense, and this is the difficulty of portraying Edgar, his whole world has been turned upside down. He's a very naive figure. In fact, that's what Edmund says about him. He's so good natured, he can't imagine that somebody could not have a good thought towards somebody else. And because of that, his, he's totally disillusioned. He's shocked. He doesn't, there's not enough of an awareness of evil in him or malicious intentions to help him to deal with the storm that's come upon him. So he is, like many people who are so naive, totally disillusioned and so he's acting the way he actually feels in the same way and in this sense Edgar is a foil for Lear he's willingly going to act like a madman whereas Lear becomes mad so uh, there's also and again Lear uh, or Shakespeare loves doing these analogies in the plays to just emphasize the themes uh, that arise here and uh, in, in this whole scene, Lear fluctuates between self-absorbed pain and a look outward to beyond appearances and compassion for his fellow creatures. So he's a more likable figure for the first time. 
but, and, and, but he does, at this point, indulge in conspiracy theories, which is, again, typical of, of somebody who's in great pain, is to see is there's an obsessive look to below surfaces to distrust everything and everyone. The, the only one he's going to distrust or to trust is the one that has no trappings of civility at all. And that is this man, Edgar, whom he will greet as a prophetic figure, as a wise man, even though he's mad. But that's precisely what lets him trust him. The whole world's gone mad. Those that appear that they're sane, I can't trust. Who am I going to trust? I'm going to trust the madman. Oh, wise madman. He won't listen to the fool, but he will listen to Edgar. So again, three fools, Edgar, the fool, and Cordelia. And Edgar comes in and says all sorts of crazy things from within. Fathom and half, fathom and half, poor Tom. Come not in here, uncle. Here's a spirit. Help me, help me. Give me my, thy hand. Who's there? A spirit, a spirit. He says his name's poor Tom. Can, what art thou that dost grumble here, there in the straw? Come forth, enter Edgar, disguised as a madman. Away, the foul fiend follows me. Through the sharp hawthorn blow the winds. Hum. Go to thy bed and warm thee. And Lear immediately sees a mirror image of himself in Edgar. Again, just like the storm, Lear sees himself. Lear sees himself in everything. He's a, his great failing is that he's, he's almost the portrait of sin. He's a self-regarding man. He looks to himself all the time. And that's why he can't remedy himself. He, he, but little knows himself. He does not look to any other template, let alone Christ as the model of himself that he should emulate, seek to emulate. He only looks at himself. And he sees himself everywhere. He sees himself in the storm. Now he sees himself in Edgar and says to Edgar, bizarrely, didn't thou give all to thy daughters? Are not thou come to this? Who gives anything to poor Tom? Whom the foul fiend hath led through fire and through flame, through ford and whirlpool, or bog and quagmire, that hath laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew, set rat's bane by his porridge, made him proud of heart to ride on a bay, trotting horse over four-inch bridges to course his own shadow for a traitor. Bless thy five wits, Tom's a cold. Oh, doady, doady, doady. Anyway, I don't need to go over his crazy speech. But again, it's, it's Lear's uh, compassion for him, and not compassion, his empathy for him. He recognizes in Edgar himself, even though there's nothing there. What have his daughters brought him to this pass? Couldst thou save nothing? Wouldst thou give them all? And the fool, nay, he reserved a blanket else we had been all shamed. Because he's got at least a blanket on, trying to poke, make fun of the situation. Lear is immune from the, the fool's humor here. He's not going to even see this. Or maybe he is. How are you going to act this scene? Is Lear at least, hmm, yes. He's, at least he's got a blanket on. Now all the plagues that in the pendulous air hang faded or man's faults light on thy daughters. He hath no daughter, sir. Death, traitor! Nothing could have subdued nature to such a lowness but his unkind daughters. Is it the fashion that discarded fathers should have thus little mercy on their flesh? Judicious punishment! Twas this flesh begot those pelican daughters. Now, pelican daughters... Um, a pelican is a, in medieval heraldry, heraldry, a pelican is often portrayed um, as, oh no, that's a cormorant. No, nope, no, nope, ignore me. I was going to go off and talk about this, and it's totally wrong. Pillicock sat on Pillicock Hill. Halloo, halloo, loo, loo. Fool, this cold night will turn us all to fools and madmen. The, the, he's still humorous, but again, does the humor even affect this sort of, Humor requires people to have sufficient self-possession, and it doesn't have to be much, that they can laugh 
at their circumstances and not be so pulled down by them that they feel fated and oppressed and incapable of response. It's very human things. Animals can't laugh. They don't laugh. Human beings laugh. It, it shows a self-possession sufficient to um, comment on the circumstances. It's not even a, I, I don't mean commentary in a, in a sense of a verbal thing, but it's a judgment of sorts. And you laugh. Gallows humor. Or even just, and sometimes it's just weeping. People, when they're laughing at circumstances, will start weeping. They're very closely allied in some ways. And likewise, when you're weeping, you can sometimes start laughing. It's a very, very interesting connection there. Uh, I'm not sure that animals weep either. In fact, they don't in the same way. There's a, it's a reflection of the, uh, the free will of man being expressed that, that transcends the physical circumstances in a way that animals are not capable of. It is a reflection on that there's a, a dim light of reason still there although it's been subdued by circumstances, it can still, the humor can pull you out of it. That's the purpose of a comedy, by the way, is to elevate you from that. Same with a tragedy, it's to make you aware and see a distance from the circumstances. Did you have a question or? Uh, yeah, I actually kind of looked up what the thing means. Okay, I Google searching. Yeah, that, the, but that's the cormorant. I'm not sure it's the pelican. Maybe it is, but it, it, is. it is. Yeah. It says in your footnotes as well. Okay. So I knew that, but I had connected with a cormorant, and because cormorants are in medieval iconography are portrayed as actually feeding their their young by by biting their own flesh and the blood that comes down. It feeds the young, and it's, it's a portrait of Christ who feeds us through his blood and so forth. So cormorants, I didn't know it was pelicans that were also considered so, uh, and I thought, oh no, hold on, it's not a pelican, it's a cormorant. Not the same bird, but maybe they are associated, maybe that is the intention here. But in which case, it's that twas this flesh begot those pelican daughters. They're feeding on his blood, literally eating his life from him. Maybe. It seems to fit, and I did, I, but I, I was not aware that it was related to pelicans per se. But let's stick with it. Makes sense. It does make sense. Um, but Lear sees the wicked and so the righteous and the unrighteous being punished here, and in so far as he does that, is he being restored to something more? judicious than the Lear that we met at the beginning of the play, who is wholly injudicious. When he sees that the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous, is he actually, to some degree, recognizing that there is a moral order that God reigns over irrespective of station? Also in the king and the fool. The rain falls on them all. They get wet, they get cold, they're subject to the human frailties. Is the problem with Lear that he's been so distanced from the common lot of mankind that he has no ability to recognize that there's an authority over him? And it seems like that is part of it. But he still wishes to suffer through the elements and he wants to to go to the bottom. He's a sort of a Cartesian. I can't, I can't trust in anything. Let me doubt everything. Let me go down to the absolute bottom. And then from that, I can, I can move back upwards. But he's trying, to, he's trying to direct his own course of redemption. This is his problem. He's the, he's the thing he needs to be delivered from, his, his willful selfishness. Um, but he has to fall in order to understand the plight of his people, uh, which was prevented from worsening by the hierarchical order that he used to lead. And this is the one positive effect of Lear's fall is that he finally has compassion for the poor. And maybe he would be a better leer, uh, leader if he were now restored to his leadership. 
and Edgar then becomes a guide to Lear in the same way um, that the fool had been, but here he's more of a, a, of a, a psychologist. He's, he's, he's leading him in his inner psychological distress. He sees him as a wise man. He's going, to be, he's going to be a replacement for the fool who represents wisdom in its full orb sense, but now we have his replacement, the madman. And I, I think there's something of that dynamic here as well, that Lear abandons the fool's counsel in favor of Edgar's counsel. And Edgar represents the lowest level of humanity, the very animalistic side uh, that has almost lost its place in the whole chain of hierarchy of being. He's an animal, but without the means that animals have to survive. We need clothing to survive in the elements. We can't actually hunt with our nails and our, our teeth. We require implements. Right? We're not, we're not, although we eat all things, we're not built in the same way that uh, carnivores are. Uh, but Edgar has been reduced to a, a pitiable state. And, and as I say, Lear sees Edgar as a mirror to himself. And later on, he will see Le Edgar as the essence of human existence. And why? Because he has a very cynical view of life. So at the end of this, Lear is really effectively a cynic. Now, the cynics were a school of philosophy in the ancient world that were called cynics, be named after the dog, the kunos because they used to lie, lie around outside on the ground. They didn't stay in houses. They didn't want possessions. They wanted to be authentic human beings, and they thought that human beings were actually just animals that pretended to be something other than they were themselves, and they were going to be authentic by, by removing from themselves all pretensions to be something other than what they are. And so he, he takes off his clothing, and Lear sees this as the height of wisdom. And now it is the height of wisdom if you're a cynic. And Lear is very cynical. Note this is a minor school of ancient philosophy. It's not the dominant school. It's one of the minor schools. But it is a school of thought that is very cynical about things. It suspects all things, all pretensions of order and civilizations and reason and so forth are delusions and let's embrace what's true about human nature which is that we are a self-deluding animal but let's just act like animals let's just act like the dog lay outside on the ground uh, it can work when you're in Athens maybe it doesn't work in Canada try being naked in the winter or lying on the ground outside that's not working you got to cover yourself up dogs don't cover themselves but it's a cynical it's an expression of your relationship to society to somebody like sleeping rough out on the ground is an expression of your alienation from the world you're you're trying to as a visible sign in your living to present yourself in the presence of other people to show them something about themselves you're trying to make a statement <clears throat> and lear sees edgar as a mirror of himself i like edgar because he's making a statement about the nature of human life Even in this, it doesn't actually do this because animals are never naked. Human beings can be naked. Animals can't be naked. They have, a, they have a coat. They have fur. They have feathers. They have scales. They're not naked. Human beings can be naked. Animals don't take their clothes off. They don't get changed. They don't wash their clothes. They clean their coats, whatever, but that's not their clothing. We can use analogies to talk about it as being the clothing of the birds and so forth. It is a figure of speech. They don't have clothing. Um, he, nakedness is something that human beings all, alone have, and it's interesting that in the garden, Adam and Eve are naked at first, and only later are they clothed. After they become aware of their sin, they recognize that they're naked and they're ashamed. There's something about nakedness before the fall that reflects a sort of native righteousness. So in our inherent physical nature, there's a righteousness to us, even in our nakedness. And it's not 
connected to clothing. Later on, it will be connect, righteousness will be connected to clothing. If you robe yourselves well, you will appear more righteous. If you dress shabbily, it will suggest something else. And so people will try and wear noble clothing to suggest a righteousness about them, and we will attribute it to them. It's not part of human nature per se, but it's a way that we can clothe human nature to reflect the original righteousness. Note how the clothing of righteousness gets so strongly connected with Christ that we, Paul will talk about being clothed in his righteousness. And he'll say that we should put on Christ even. Favorite phrase, we put on Christ, be, be in Christ even. <laughs> Reflecting on that original state of human nature where they're naked and then they clothe. And note that they first clothe themselves by cutting down some, some leaves and sewing fig leaves together. And then eventually God shows compassion towards them and clothes them in an animal skin. A sacrifice has been made, in other words, for them. Out of compassion by God for their pitiable situation. And now, you, again, you might want to compare and contrast what God does in that scene with what happens to Edgar and Lear's reflection on it. What does humanity do as a, as a remedy to the lack of righteousness in human nature? But here, as I say, the, the clothing and nakedness are, are one of the distinctions between men and animals. It distinguishes us from the animals. Um, and a very superficial view is that wearing uh, Clothes is what distinguishes us, but actually it's the nakedness that distinguishes us. It's not the clothes. Animals can't go naked. So when Lear comes to this and sees him in, uh, unclothed before him as a reflection of his true humanity, he's uh, still looking at things superficially. You don't become more human by taking your clothes off. But that's how he sees it. Because he, see, he associates that with being like an animal and therefore being truer to ourselves. Not so. So his judgment is, is off. <laughs> and, and, and he sees uh, uh, clothings as lendings from animals. Is this in this line? I think it's 259 is what I have in my notes, but I'm not sure this, no, it can't be, it's incorrect. Scene doesn't even go. I think that was a back to act two, scene four. But, um, and he wants to become naked like Edgar at this point because he sees it as a, an expression of a genuine human nature. And that's what he wants. Remember, this is a broken man who, like Descartes, doubts everything. He's thrown into disarray, can't trust anything. Let me start from something I can trust. And I can trust not in superficial things like clothes. Let me trust in my nature, shorn of all trappings of royalty. So let's get naked. Lear wants his clothes off as well, right? And, that, and now, like it's a crazy logic, but it makes sense on a level of a man who wants to trust in things. Becomes the naturist. Now, why does Edgar take on this role to protect himself from being recognized? Very much like Hamlet, he'll put on, who, who puts on an antic disposition. He feigns madness. Edgar, likewise, is feigning madness so he won't be recognized. Lear, on the other hand, who's a foil, they're foils from another, does it for a different motivation. He does it to recognize himself because he has no sense of himself. Here's a man who has no sense of anything right. A very cynical king. Now in the revised version of King Lear by Shakespeare, Edgar is given more lines and Kent is fewer um, to show the importance of, of Edgar. And Edgar uh, later on condemns the uh, simple act of lust in relation to Edmund because it has its consequences because he realizes his brother has done him wrong and he denounces lust uh, which give rise to all sorts of other evils. Very interesting thing. I think I should, let me just pause here for a second and we'll take a break and we'll come back to this. <clears throat>